Sir Anthony Selden, welcome to Politics Joe. Thanks for having me. <laughs> How would you describe yourself? What was the best way that I could introduce you to the listener? Biographer of Prime Ministers, perhaps? Um, yeah, I mean, depending on what we're talking about. Uh, but um, pioneer of happiness in uh, education and in helping young people to learn who they are and, and how to lead meaningful lives as opposed to get lots of results. And that's a really big deal for me. Or walking across Europe to the Ukraine front line and creating this path of peace across Europe. But we can talk about prime ministers. <laughs> Both of those important for the biography that you've written, Trust at 10, How Not to Be Prime Minister. Can I start with a positive? You said that she is a better, or was a better prime minister than Boris Johnson. Why did you say that? Well, it was slightly a joke, you know, and it's been taken slightly seriously because I had written a book uh, with my colleague, Raymond Ewell, and it was about how awful Boris was. And um, I think that Boris Johnson did more damage. Um, and that was partly a Brexit look. Uh, there's a case for Brexit. I don't go with it myself, but it's a case of Brexit. He tipped the country into Brexit and the referendum for selfish reasons, not for empirical reasons. Um, and then he failed to get the Be Brexit dividend when he became prime minister. But he did so many other things that cheapened and coarsened national life. And so I think, I mean, I mean she was really bad as a prime minister, um, but actually, I think she, she inflicted less damage. Less damage. Mm. It's not exactly a glowing uh, appraisal of her, uh, her role in the administration, uh, I mean, is it? I mean, she caused a lot of damage. I mm -hmm. mean, extraordinary in such a short amount of time. Uh, and in, in a way, it shows the power of the prime minister. Uh, I mean, her period in power, 49 days, showed both the weaknesses of the prime minister, but also prime ministerial power to do so much um, in such a short time, particularly, obviously, the mini budget. Um, and uh, to get it so disastrously wrong, because because why? I happen to think that the objectives were right. The country needs to grow. It hasn't grown since the global financial crisis. We badly need regeneration and growth. We badly need leveling up indeed. But Boris Johnson no more achieved leveling up than she achieved growth. And indeed, she's made the case for growth arguably much harder because she did it in such a uh, terrible way. And I mean, the prime minister's power, you know, you've got to be a historian to be a successful prime minister. You've got to understand um, not just the office in history and what it can and can't do, but also what your historic opportunity is. And all the great prime ministers are storytellers. I mean, Clement Attlee was a great storyteller. Winston Churchill, obviously, in 1940, and not just 1940, and Margaret Thatcher, another um, prime minister who made a huge difference, or David Lloyd George. These were storytellers. They saw themselves as operating in history. She never did that. She was just obsessed uh, by her rightness and by the fact that there was a conspiracy to do her down. And you see that now. There's no contrition. The damage she's done to individuals' personal finances, young people's personal finances, elderly people, to companies, to the position of Britain in the world. Uh, I mean, the, the, the rebuke she received from Joe Biden uh, in the ice cream parlor when he dissed her policies, mm. he, is unique in in uh, certainly the last 70 years of British history, but also if you're a conservative, the damage she's done to the conservative party. And you would expect anyone who's got it so spectacularly wrong to show some humility and contrition, but she hasn't. She's doubled down on it, doubled down on it, and, <laughs> and blamed other people even more. 
But where do you think that comes from? I mean, so before she became prime minister, you wrote a piece in this, the New Statesman and you said that a prime minister is only as good as their court. Do you think that she had a failure or an inability to listen to the people around her? Or do you think that she, well, appointed the wrong people? Well, I think a bit of both. Um, and she didn't want strong people around her. So Kwasi Kwarteng... Uh, one of perhaps the most economically, historically, e economically um, literate uh, thinking Chancellor of the Exchequer for years and years. Uh, brilliant mind, but he was not strong. He knew that she was making mistakes. And it's one of the great puzzles of history. Why did he not uh, impress on her? Why ultimately did he not resign and say, look, if you go ahead and do it in this way, it's going to crash, it's going to burn, and we're both going to be, uh, we're both going to be uh, laughing stocks ultimately, uh, and I'll resign if, if you don't do the kind of things I'm saying. He uh, said things, but he didn't uh, stamp his foot, and he didn't threaten her. So I think she didn't like to be surrounded by people who uh, were strong, who would really stand up to her, uh, but at the end of the day, and she, but she appointed some very good people too, and, and she was not pleasant about them. And she, as the book says, um, she could enjoy humiliating people. And uh, she was peculiar in her personal relationships uh, often. And uh, another way that she differed from Margaret Thatcher, not just Margaret Thatcher, bided her time, rolled the pitch made certain she had people on side before she started unleashing her policies. Whether one likes them or not, it was a clear uh, statecraft. She knew what she was doing. Liz Truss had no idea about that. Margaret Thatcher loved being challenged. Liz Truss hated it. She thought anyone who challenged her was part of the, uh, the woke conspiracy. And she um, didn't like uh, strong people around her. And Thatcher did so, uh, but I think ultimately, you know, you have to blame the prime minister. Uh, it's a really lonely job. You have the best advisors the country can give you, the smartest, loyalist, hardest working people. You don't diss them, you don't trash them, you don't ignore them. And if they're saying things uh, like this is too much, it's too quick, you're doing it in the wrong way, talking of the mini budget. Mm. Um, and she'd listen to them rather than uh, just thinking that they were out to do her down, then it could have been a different story because she wasn't stupid. She, she's smart. She was a fighter. She'd fought her way uh, up. Uh, she had a clear idea. A lot of prime ministers, incredibly, I think, arrive at Downing Street. Is Keir Starmer one of those? Um, I don't think so, but he's certainly not the clearest, ideologically clear prime ministers who've come into number 10. Uh, but there are many more who arrive without a clear idea. They've got a, they've got a kind of, they've got a slogan, you know, uh, the classless society uh, or um, burning injustices. Um, and, but they don't stack up to, or the big society, they don't stack up to a program for government. And um, you know, she did have that. You know, she was uh, she got didn't just get a core objective, but she got I think the right one. But she then everything else was wrong about the way that she implemented it, uh, the speed, the lack of pitch rolling, the lack of communication, the lack of bringing people on side, and the the dissing of uh, of of um, the head of the treasury. Uh, it was quite personal, Tom Scholar. He uh, was he was the person who best understood exactly the crisis that she got into with the financial markets. Um, and but she wasn't uh, she um, did without the OBR, which um, was a clear mistake. Um, she didn't really understand the way financial markets operated. Um, she just was obsessed uh, by a, her passion and she didn't listen and she didn't study previous examples of successful leadership.
But then who was she listening to then? So who was influencing this policy? I understand what you're talking about with her, you know, clarity and ideology, but it has to have come from somewhere. And, you know, well, that is probably the Institute of Economic Affairs. Why mm. did she take their advice over advice, say, from the OBR? Because she believed uh, that the IEA was right. So the Institute of Economic Affairs was also the biggest influence on Margaret Thatcher. Uh, and it's, um, it, it, it's a case book study. A lot of the book is a case book on how not to be prime minister. These are the 10 things that the prime minister needs to do if they're to be successful. Uh, and she broke almost all of them. I mean, she broke all of them to different extents. Uh, but some she broke more spectacularly than, than others. Um, so I think that uh, what the IEA was arguing for about, uh, uh, it chimed with her. It chimed ever since she got into Parliament. She was um, captivated by the IEA and by the ideas. Her two great heroes were Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher. I'm not aware that she had read books on either of them. She had a uh, a kind of uh, A-level knowledge, I think, is almost too far, a GCSE kind of knowledge, a sense of them, but not a sense of their statecraft and how they uh, went about uh, doing things. So, um, but then uh, where, does this, uh, where does this brilliant mind, where do you attribute that to? If, if her two biggest heroes, you don't think she even has a GCSE qualification in them, where do you? Uh, and how she had do a brilliant you... mathematical mind. Right. She was could be very clever, very persuasive, irrepressible in her uh, determination. Uh, but uh, you know, there are many different kinds of uh, of brilliance. So uh, people can be um, <laughs> evil and, and intellectually brilliant. I don't think she was evil, uh, but I think that she was simply hugely misguided. I think it was her character flaw. Um, look, it was unusual to have somebody so experienced coming into number 10. She was the most experienced incoming prime minister uh, for over 30 years in terms of cabinet experience. Uh, she had a clear plan. She was uh, knew what she was doing. She gave her cabinet ministers very clear instructions about what to do. All that uh, gets uh, you know, is good. But then it went wrong because, um, because of her, um, because of her inability to read the room, inability to understand uh, the nature of power, the way the prime minister works, the need to to to, to bring your team on side and behind you. And um, is you know, that where it comes from? The sort of her sense of conspiracy, or the or, or almost her paranoia that you've alluded to, that people were turning against her. Is that where it comes from? She uh, thought that there was a um, conspiracy and it involved, and we hear it now, don't we? We, we hear it in the speeches that she's made since she has left power, uh, the Treasury, the City of London, the Bank of England, the Civil Service at large, the BBC, uh, universities, uh, the OBR, the IMF, uh, they're all part of an anti-growth uh, establishment um, who have done her down. No, uh, they didn't do you down. You did yourself down because you, as the book says, you had no idea how to, how to do things. Um, she came into a china shop and she barked and she shouted and she... Uh, and it all broke, and, uh, and uh, then it was everyone else's responsibility. Um, so uh, it was something, the book is designed to try and prevent that ever happening again. It was unusual to have two prime ministers, Boris Johnson, who did enormous damage, followed by Liz Truss, who did enormous damage. At the end of the book, I compare them to Scott Fitzgerald at the end of Gatsby, mm. talking about Tom and Daisy. And, and I say, you know, they were careless people, uh, Boris and Liz. They smashed things up and, uh, uh, and then retreated into their richness and their reveries and their dreams and left other people to clear up the mess they left behind. Um, and the damage will, will go on. 
um, and on that, that they did. Uh, and it's partly what they did and it's partly what they didn't do in that time when you have power and uh, when you need to uh, be an example and to trash, endlessly to trash without reforming. Um, you know, trashing the Treasury, trashing uh, the Bank of England, trashing the civil service. All these uh, institutions uh, need uh, reform and modernization, but the way to do that isn't to slag them off and, uh, uh, and think you're superior. Uh, it is to get in there and to sort it out and to work out, as we talked about in the Institute for Government Commission on the Center, which is looking at how you can have a world-class center of government in, in Britain. The report came out, launched by Gordon Brown and uh, John Major in the spring. Um, and uh, we put enormous work into that, trying to think how we can have a top-class government in Britain, which transparently we don't. Was any of that legacy repaired by Rishi Sunak? Well, it was difficult, wasn't it? I mean, we when you have a historical mind uh, set, you look at prime ministers, uh, you look at Gordon Brown in 2007, and you can say, well, okay, the global financial crisis, good, he did some good stuff on um, uh, on the environment, um, but uh, and in other areas too, but, but really, um, you know, the global financial crisis was a reaction in terms of being proactive, he didn't do that much, but you then have to think, well, supposing he'd taken over in 1997, um, uh, uh, how much more uh, might he have achieved than Tony Blair? It's very hard to come in. Um, and at the end of a long period of one party dominates the nation and do much, particularly for Rishi Sunak. I mean, the interesting question is what would have happened if Sunak had taken over 49 days before um, uh, and, uh, uh, and had Boris Johnson and his uh, allies not manoeuvred Liz Truss into power? Um, then he might have been able to do more without that 73, 72 billion pound black hole and without Jeremy Hunt having to come in and, uh, and save the economy. So uh, I think that um, uh, what will Rishi Sunak be judged for? I, obviously, immigration uh, and uh, Rwanda uh, are um, black marks. Uh, they didn't achieve uh, what they said they'd achieve. Uh, but I think um, in terms of restoring the position of the country and its standing credibility in uh, Berlin and, uh, and Washington and, and Paris and beyond, uh, I think um, they didn't do a bad job in stabilizing a frighteningly unpredictable position, which... Um, you know, people compare to 1976 and the IMF crisis when Jim Callaghan took over from Harold Wilson in the spring of 76 and the country was severely rocked. It could have been uh, as bad. There were the skates under this country. People uh, who know and understand things were seriously worried about what the mini-budget had done. So um, Rishi Sunak, very, I think he did a, a uh, what will history say? I think it will say that he did a, given the constraints, he did a pretty good job, didn't get everything right, obviously made some personal misjudgments, uh, but uh, didn't do it all badly. Was there a sense of frustration, or did Liz Truss experience any frustration um, from you know, Rishi Sunak's premiership? Because during that, Jeremy Hunt was reducing taxes, and arguably that was her ideology, that's what she was pushing for. I mean, albeit they did it in a more possibly sensible way they didn't do it quite as as fast and they you know allocated to the spending but do you think from her point of view she would be frustrated watching them go through with it and you know it, it being almost a success uh every former prime minister oh my goodness why would anyone want that job lousy pay uh, lousy time, you're, you're booted out, they're all booted out in one way or another um, and finish in tears. And um, so, you know, they all look over their shoulder. Tony Blair did the Andrew Rawnsley uh, interview at the weekend uh, with Blair and the Observer, for example, you know, wished he hadn't gone, uh, looked back. And uh, I'm sure that... Uh, 
as she looked back in fury, Boris Johnson looked back and thinks, you know, thought if only I stayed another week, I could have, you know, had the Queen, that would have kept me there, like uh, uh, Zelensky kept me in power for, uh, you know, a few more days and, and, and weeks um, uh, when, uh, after the invasion of uh, Ukraine, that helped give Boris Johnson a, a sense of purpose. Uh, and he'd have loved uh, the, the, the coronation and the uh, and the uh, funeral uh, arrangements. So you know, he but looked that back. They, they, they all looked back. I, I don't know. I mean, I don't know whether she rues the fact mm. that, uh, that 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 uh, Sunak was able to do some of the things that uh, she had wanted to do, and he's some of them, um, and he'd have been able to do much more if she hadn't uh, created so much. Uh, damage, but um, possibly, but I don't think that's her dominant feeling. Her dominant feeling is still one of betrayal, great, great betrayal. The country uh, and its institutions uh, and people uh, betrayed her fine uh, notion uh, that could have saved this country, uh, saved the West. Look at her book and the book title. Um, it's hard to think of a single prime minister uh, post premiership, certainly um, in the last hundred years. I mean, Lloyd George did some fairly disobliging, foolish things um, in the 30s, uh, but uh, hard to think of anyone since the Second World War. Uh, I mean, Churchill went off forting in the uh, Mediterranean with. Uh, uh, the rich um, Greek ship owner Aristotle Anassis. I mean, but that wasn't, you know, that was just, uh, uh, um, that, that was just sybaritic. It wasn't necessarily bad. I mean, it's hard to think of anybody who has so brought further dishonor on the office than she has done by blaming other people. Um, and by, but this is uh, perhaps a political judgment rather than a historic judgment, supporting Donald Trump. Um, somebody who clearly doesn't believe in the uh, nature of the democratic uh, system on which the United States was born uh, with its belief in, in democracy and disowned by Donald Trump and she wants, has wanted to support him and affirm him. So these seem to me to be fundamental errors of judgment in a, in a Democrat. Is that an error of judgment or is that a push of popularity? I mean, do you truly think that she is ideologically aligned with Donald Trump? I can't see inside her mind. No. And I think it's probably blurred, as it is in many politicians' minds. They believe positions that are uh, popular. It's incredibly uh, intoxicating. I've just got back from Nuremberg as part of the walk I'm doing across... Uh, Europe, uh, and you know, you see where the Nuremberg rallies took place, and then you look at the pictures of Hitler and his uh, uh, co-leaders, uh, and then you see their faces uh, a few years later at the Nuremberg trials in the same city, uh, and you know, you can see uh, exultation uh, decline into despair and vacancy. I mean, it's incredibly intoxicating to be popular, and, and, and you, you love it. I mean, did it, did it get the better of Tony Blair when he, uh, when he went in front of the crowds um, and heard people shouting in former Yugoslavia for his, uh, for his name? I mean, it, it is it's difficult. Uh, every political leader wants to be popular. I don't know uh, whether that's what uh, makes her support Donald Trump um, or uh, whether she uh, really does believe in him as a person um, and in his policies. But I don't think it's um, appropriate for a former Prime Minister of Britain to openly uh, support uh, a leader of another country who has, um, ha ha has, has trashed uh, dem clearly democracy in their own country. Why do you think she ran for election again? I mean, surely, you know, seeing at the end of her, um, you know, time as MP, that could be arguably seen as respectable. But why did she run again? 
Uh, I'm sure that she would like to come back. I mean, some of the very short, as I talk about in the book, um, which um, is really trying to, to understand what happens in, in Downing Street. That's why I use so many uh, conversations between people to try and, and bring it all to life and to realize what it's like. I think that uh, many of the short-serving prime ministers want to come back and they think that... Uh, this time they can get it right. Um, and I'm sure that she harbors, and probably still harbors, a notion that uh, uh, the, the party will come back for her, uh, call her back to power. Uh, maybe Jeremy Corbyn has the same uh, notion in his head. Uh, does Jeremy Corbyn uh, ache for the Starmer project to implode so that the Labour comes back to him. I mean, funny things go on, but understandable things in the heads of, uh, of former leaders. They, above all, want their successors to fail um, because it makes them look better and it gives them that opportunity. So many speculating that she... Um, uh, we certainly know that, like Boris Johnson, Boris Johnson also harboured seriously uh, the notion that he could come back. I mean, he supported... He helped create Liz Truss as Prime Minister, joined together... Uh, not by a common bond of personal fondness or common ideology, because their ideology was very different, but uh, in common contempt of Rishi Sunak. Uh, Boris Johnson supported her emotionally and with his own supporters when she was in power, to keep, partly to keep Sunak out. And then when Boris Johnson s smelt in his nostrils even the vaguest scent of the possibility to return to Downing Street, um, he he pulled the rug uh, from under her. But by then, she was, anyway, dead in the water. I mean, the, the, her own cabinet had uh, ha, had given up and, uh, and, and MPs had given up on her. So, um, but uh, I would think for Liz Truss, that was the reason, the hope of being able to come back. And that's understandable. Um, that would be her total dream. It didn't work out first time but now it will. Um, but, you know, she's made it harder for that free market dream uh, to, 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 to have the, the credibility because of the way that she, she implemented it. I mean, can you explain that a little bit further? So you don't think that the free market dream will ever be realised because of what she did? Well, um, I mean, ever is a very big word, and one thing we know about uh, history is that we tend to think that everything is uh, is special and unique, and things will never happen. But when you uh, come back and and step back, you see that there are cycles, and there are cycles in in British politics. Um, uh, I wrote about this with David. Markwin 30 years ago, where the country moves in a status centralizing uh, big government direction, and then it shifts in the other direction. And these are um, uh, part of the, the pulses and, uh, and rhythms and waves uh, of British history, uh, like they are of history everywhere else. Uh, so nothing is, is, is settled forever. But I think she's damaged the credibility of the case for the free market. Mm -hmm. Um, in the same way that Margaret Thatcher added to the credibility. I mean, would Tony Blair and would Gordon Brown have invited her to Downing Street? Uh, would they have uh, sought her affirmation uh, if they, those policies hadn't been a success? Obviously, they're not a success if you are in the uh, coal mining areas and, uh, and uh, former industrial areas of Britain, but, but on a macro national level, the policies were clearly uh, a success, as was Britain's improved standing in the world in 1990 compared to 1969 of Europe in 1979. So, you know, they're, they're happy to wrap themselves in uh, her garments at least a little. Um, now, no one's going to want to, to wrap the, has, themselves in the, in the garments of Liz Truss's free market uh, brand of free marketism. So, you know, but look, the tide will turn in, in, in 10, 20, 30 years, as it will over the EU. Uh, and um, 
you know, there'll be a new rapprochement between Britain and the, either the EU as now or its successor. Where do you th where does her that absolutely extraordinary claim that she was considering uh, removing cancer treatment from the NHS or the availability was, was of it? Was it really extraordinary? Um, so she as a, as a bystander, I have to say, it was okay. rather in, or onlooker. Okay. It was extraordinary. Okay, I'm, I understood. <laughs> so uh, what happened was that her policies had created a seventy-two billion pounds black hole. Now, to get that into context, uh, Keir Starmer currently has been talking about a black hole of 20 billion, which is just over a quarter. I mean, I mean it's, it's a quarter, uh, roughly, of, of this black hole. Or George Osborne in the uh, austerity uh, 2010s um, managed to, m to get 30 billion. This was 72 billion, well over double. Uh, what uh, George Osborne achieved, and it had to be done very, very quickly to reassure the markets when they opened on Monday that the British government was serious in its ability to get on top of its own finances. And the Treasury produced um, a series of, um, uh, uh, of shocking cuts that the country could uh, consider, the government could consider on behalf of the country, uh, to get quick cut through, and on that list were cutting back on cancer treatment on the NHS, uh, alongside a lot of other things. Now, that list, um, uh, would, it, would she have seen it? Probably. I mean, things were moving very, very quickly, so it's hard to say, confirm, that she certainly uh, saw it um, and considered it, but it certainly was produced so it would be seen by uh, her and Kwarteng, who was still the Chancellor. Uh, and her advisers uh, were worried. Um, she was going around screaming, I don't believe it, we're going to have to make cuts, cuts going to happen, cuts, uh, we're going to have to have cuts, 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 cuts. And they were worried about what she might do. Um, and they themselves then um, came up with a plan because they were petrified about what was happening and the reports they were getting back about uh, the city and... Uh, and the financial markets, uh, what would happen unless uh, there was uh, belief again that the British government knew what it was doing as opposed to junking the head of the Treasury, junking the OBR, junking the whole financial framework. It, it was as if the, um, uh, the totally ignorant people were in charge of, uh, of the country's finances, people who just didn't understand the way that these things work and the basis of, of trust and predictability uh, that, that are, um, are in the very fabric of, of the way that financial markets work. So um, they were worried about it. Uh, they thought this was a possibility. Uh, and they knew, they knew her mind. Of course, it never, there was never time for her to do it or uh, to consider it. But yeah, that was how desperate the country was the plight uh, that she had put the country into, that it was even being considered. The Treasury wouldn't have produced it if it didn't think it was a credible uh, decision. That on a long list of possibilities, that was mentioned as one of the possibilities. So after all that, we're now looking at a Conservative leadership election. Are there any of those candidates that you think are most suited to being Prime Minister? Um, I don't... No, um, I think it would be helpful if they were to admit how wrong, um, in particular, the Truss and the Johnson premierships were, um, and how it was n would never be like it again. I mean, they broke a fundamental uh, tenet, not just of Conservative uh, Party um, a Conservative Party philosophy in power, and practice in power, but also of Labour. Um, and I don't see that honesty at the moment. Uh, there's a pet, they're petrified of admissions we picked up by Starmer as further evidence of uh, blaming uh, the Conservatives. Um, I wrote a book, um, edited a book with Tom Edgerton on the Conservative Party in power, uh, from 2010 to 24, uh, and this was clearly the least um, effective 
period of Conservative Party uh, dominance, going all the way back to the birth of the Conservative Party in the 1830s, 1840s. Um, and, you know, um, 2024, it's quite unlike 1979, the last time the Conservatives lost power, or 1964, when they lost power then, after substantial periods in in government of substantial um, economic, social uh, achievement um, and, and progress. Um, this was a, a, a very poor period of government. There were some good prime ministers, there were some good ministers, there were some good policies. It wasn't all uh, black, but I think uh, it would be a good starting point uh, and a good basis for rebuilding I mean, far overused is, is the analogy um, of the uh, work in the 1990s in South Africa of the Truth and Reconciliation. But, you know, uh, and, and so it's a hackneyed example, but just a glimmer of that sense that actually, you know, we got this wrong. We got it really badly wrong. We let down not just our own voters and supporters, but we let down the country. Um, we didn't have enough consistent policy. Uh, we didn't. Uh, we weren't serious enough. We had two people, uh, Boris Johnson and Liz Truss, who were simply not serious enough about the job of being prime minister. Uh, and we're sorry about that. Uh, and we are determined to put all that behind us uh, and to build the Conservative Party as it has been when it's been at its best, which is as a moral force uh, in the country and a centralizing uh, force, um, again, uh, which wouldn't go anywhere near uh, some of the policies that the Conservatives had gone through up to 2024 and which some of the candidates are talking about now. Sir Anthony, thank you very much. Um, Trust at 10, how not to be Prime Minister is you can buy it now. Um, by now, we mean now. Uh, click, go out, better still, support your local bookshop.